The persistence package contains classes and functions which have the role of persisting or storing data beyond the life cycle of an Android process. If you don't know what a process is, it simply means a program which is running on a device. Practically speaking, we will store the progress which the user has made in the current Sudoku game, as well as the settings for that game, and the user's personal records or statistics as I call them. Here's a quick look at the architecture of the persistence package. The game repository, in this situation, functions as a back-end decision maker for the two data sources which it coordinates. The data sources themselves just try to carry out CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, and either report with a success or a failure if an exception is thrown. The general principle here is to keep things together which makes sense to be kept together, to separate what doesn't need to be kept together, and to also use an abstraction or an interface in any place where the implementation might change. I might decide to stop using the local file storage or proto data store, so hiding these details from the repository is not over-engineering but rather a calculated decision. Speaking of data sources or storage mechanisms, we will use two different mechanisms for storing our data. Firstly, we will store the user's preferred game settings and their personal statistics in Proto Data Store. Data Store provides a lightweight and efficient way to store this kind of data using protocol buffers. Protocol buffers is a serialization language similar to JSON. However, I find it easier to read than JSON, and fortunately, the library we will use also comes with its own protobuf compiler that will generate some of the boilerplate code which we would otherwise need to write ourselves. We also use the device's file storage to store the progress of the user in the currently active game. Every Android app is given some memory space to store files, which is what we will use. This is done by making all of the domain models implement serializable, and using Java's input and output streams to read and write objects from Kotlin language. So, in case you aren't following along with the tutorial and you haven't downloaded the starting point repository, uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to add a directory called proto in the main source set. The starting point repository should already have that directory. So just go ahead and right click on it and go to new file. And this file is going to be called game underscore settings dot proto and make sure it's all lowercase. Go ahead and type this in the top of the file. So protocol buffers are essentially like a serialization language. It's very similar to JSON. Um, if you want to look more into it, you can about what the benefits and uh, the pros and cons of using something like JSON. But personally, this being the only uh, project that I've used protocol buffers in so far, I'm quite happy with it. Okay, so let's just add two more lines and I'll explain some more from there. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but basically what's going to happen here is we're going to define this uh, protocol buffer message, as it's called, which is kind of like a data type, for lack of a better term. And what uh, we can do is, uh, so this file will be consumed by something called the uh, protocol buffer compiler. And in this case, what we're basically telling it is that we're going to be generating uh, Java files. Now in the generated class files, uh, the protocol buffer compiler is going to basically add whatever we put in the Java package as the package for the generated Java class file. It's just useful to not mix up your namespaces and stuff like that. And as for the second option here, Java multiple files, um, if you don't have that turned on, then what can happen is that basically the generated Java files will all be in one single file. Uh, we don't really want that, although I'm not sure if it's absolutely integral to getting this application to work. Like I say, we're going to go through this pretty practically, and I'm not an expert in protocol buffers. Okay, now we're going to define a message, which is kind of like one of the main data types, for lack of a better term, in this particular language. 
Okay, so let's talk about what we just did here. So we've defined a message, which in protocol buffers is, is kind of like a data type or a, a collection of fields. And we've done two things. So within the game settings message, we have a 32-bit integer, so like a, kind of a smaller integer um, to represent the boundary of a Sudoku puzzle. So when I say boundary, I mean like a four by four Sudoku puzzle will have a boundary of four. A nine by nine Sudoku puzzle will have a boundary of nine, obviously. And the other thing we did here is we defined an enum in protocol buffers. Now, when you're creating these enums, uh, you'll need like a default value unknown, and then you've got the other values that the uh, enum can potentially be. Also, notice how um, in boundary and difficulty, the fields above the enum, I'm giving it default values. Naturally, those will be like the values that the uh, protocol buffer gets preloaded with, like the first time you access it. Now, the important thing to understand here is that assuming you've added the support for protocol buffers into your build Gradle configuration, the protobuffer compiler is going to actually generate some Java files or classes out of this particular message. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I've opened up the completed project and I'm just having a look at the file which was generated by the protocol buffer compiler. And all I really want you to notice here is that when you're using uh, Proto Data Store, what's going to happen is it's actually going to generate a Java class for you. Obviously, you can see we have our game settings in camel case, which is what we defined as our message. And then we also have that enum defined below. So what does this actually do for us? Basically, this is going to allow us to serialize or basically translate from Java into the protocol buffer language and vice versa. And it also means that we don't actually have to create our own plain old Java object in order to do that. The library is going to generate that for us, but we can still use it in our code, which we'll do in a moment. We're going to add one more proto file. So go ahead and open up the uh, proto directory, right click. Again, go to file. And this one's going to be called user statistics dot proto. All right, so I've just copied and pasted the first three lines from the other proto file because we'll be reusing them. And we are going to create another message here. Now, when I say statistics, this is kind of like my way of talking about the user's personal records. So uh, what are the shortest times to completion uh, that a user has uh, made in solving a particular size and difficulty in a particular Sudoku puzzle. It's pretty straightforward, so let's just write it out. And there you have it. Now you might be wondering why I'm using 64-bit integers here. So these actual values are going to be stored in milliseconds, which is why I do want the 64-bit uh, uh, integer storage there instead of the 32-bit integer. I'm not actually 100% sure if that's necessary, but I did that just to be safe. And realistically, it's not really gonna eat up that much extra memory. Okay, so that's it for our protocol buffer files. Uh, now we're going to have to create some protocol buffer data stores, which is how we're actually going to create and access our protocol buffers. Go ahead and right click on the persistence package, go to new Kotlin file or class, and this is just going to be a file called data stores. Okay, so before proceeding, you're going to want to go to build and make project. Now the build will probably fail, but all we really want it to do is to generate the appropriate uh, Java class out of the protocol buffer. But if for some reason that doesn't work for you, uh, just follow along and eventually it will work. Okay, so for each protocol buffer based data source, we're going to need to provide a way to get a hold of it or create it from uh, context. Then the other thing we'll need is a serializer. Go ahead and import everything. 
And there's two things we need to add into the delegate here. Okay, so don't worry that it's showing up red. We'll actually write this serializer next. So I just wanted to explain what's going on here. So um, we're creating a data store object and it takes the protocol buffer generated Java class, which is called game settings. And essentially what this does is it creates a reference which, which we can use to either store or retrieve our protocol buffer. Now you might be wondering what game underscore setting dot pb is and why it has a different file extension than our proto files. To the best of my understanding, uh, game underscore settings dot pb is something that's generated after the fact by the compiler, whereas the proto file is something we write for the compiler to consume. But in case I'm wrong on that, then feel free to flame me on Twitter. The other thing we'll need is a serializer, which takes care of serialization, quite obviously. After that, you can just click here, hit Alt Insert, Override Methods, and we only need the methods from the serializer interface. So again, let's write the code and then I'll explain what I need to explain after the fact. Okay, so I'm gonna keep the details here pretty light. So obviously when we create our data store, it's given the game setting serializer here. And what the serializer does is it helps us to read and write from input streams. So in other words, we're going to be obviously reading from a protocol buffer file, and then that's gonna be serialized or rather deserialized into Java and vice versa. So basically what the Android team has done for us here is they've made it a lot easier to handle things like error handling and dealing with input streams. Because if you've ever worked with input streams in Java, then you can tell there's, you know, you're probably familiar with a lot of boilerplate code to do with that. So basically we do a little bit of boilerplate work here and it translates to a very simple API when we actually want to read and write with this particular tool in the back end, which we'll be doing in a moment. Okay. Now, obviously we need to write another uh, data store and also serializer for the other data type. So this is gonna be one of those rare scenarios where I do actually just copy and paste because there's absolutely nothing new. We're just going to change a couple of the words. So this would be one of the points where I encourage you to have the complete source code open on the side. And then that way you can do a little bit of copy paste action like I'm going to do now. And that is our data stores file complete. Now, obviously, if you had a whole bunch of these, you'd probably want to use separate files. But since I only have the two, I just decided to stick them in the same file. Right click on the persistence package and go to new Kotlin class. This one's going to be called local game storage impl. So firstly, we're going to make a constant which will represent the name of the text file that we will be reading and writing the game data to. Next, we'll create the constructor. 
So you might be wondering where file storage directory comes from. When we create the build logic of this application, which is kind of like my inversion of control dependency injection type stuff, what's going to happen is we're going to call this one function to the Android system, which will return us the specific directory from the system where we can read and write things like files. Let's go ahead and implement the interface. Now I'm going to try to get through this relatively quickly, but one thing I want to explain is that you'll notice I'm making fairly extensive usage of helper functions. The reason for that is just to avoid writing redundant code. Also, as with the other implementations, we're going to be using the with context coroutine builder to do this kind of IO work off of the main thread. So what we'll do is we'll call a helper function called update game data and we'll pass it in the game data. And if that operation happens to be successful, then we'll actually just return the same game object that was passed in because it should be consistent. Okay, now we can create the helper. So here we're going to throw the exception so that it'll actually get picked up by the catch block in the functions that we'll be calling this helper. Now we're going to be using input and output streams, which are part of the Java standard library in order to write our data to and from the file. If you're wondering kind of what this word stream means, ultimately what we're actually doing kind of at the low level is we're going to take our uh, game or Sudoku puzzle object and we're going to serialize it into basically a stream or a very long sequence of textual characters. And that's what we'll actually be reading and writing from the file. Okay, so two points, you always want to close your streams. Also, you might be wondering how is it that we can say dot write object and pass in our Sudoku puzzle? Well, let's just check the parameters here. So I'm gonna hit control P within the parameter brackets. And as you can see, it accepts any type. Now, the important thing is that if our different classes like Sudoku puzzle and Sudoku node did not extend serializable, then we wouldn't be able to do this without errors. So for update node, it's a little bit different. We're just updating one individual node. So how this is going to work is we're going to get the old data and then we're just going to update that individual node and then we will rewrite the result back to storage. So get game will be another helper we write. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write that one right away. Otherwise the autocomplete and error handling stuff will be all over the place. 
Okay, that's what we need to do there. Now, just a quick reminder here, when we say color and really whenever anyone talks about a color in a graph data structure, they're really just talking about a number. So in this case, the number represents the actual value placed in a particular Sudoku square. So it'll be like something from one through nine or one through four, depending on the boundary of the Sudoku. We'll also update the elapsed time. After it's updated, we will write that result uh, to storage, hopefully. And just to keep the front end synchronized with everything else, then we will return that same game object. Now, it has just come to my attention that I have forgotten to add a particular integer called color to this particular function when I wrote it. So let's just go ahead and fix that now. There we go. And I managed to save the easiest for last. And that's it for this file. Right click on the persistence package, go to new, Kotlin class. This one's going to be called game repository impl. So in case you jumped ahead and you aren't actually familiar with the repository pattern, I actually already explained that in part two of this series where I built the domain package. In any case, let me just re reiterate what the purpose of this particular class is. It's basically like a bridge and decision maker for the back end. Now, sometimes you'll have multiple different repositories or data sources in the back end, and it might be a good idea to keep them separate. The reason why I didn't in this particular case is because the game storage and the settings storage are actually inextricably linked. They are by nature closely related. So based on that and the fact that this isn't actually a very large application, I chose to put them together within this repository. And then how it'll work is that the repository will coordinate these two different data sources. Let's start with the constructor. and the repository interface. Okay, so as you can see, we have our work cut out for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to write the code relatively quickly. And after it's written, I'll explain what it does.
So there shouldn't be anything new in this particular function except for the fact that we're making an assignment statement within a control statement, val current game result equals etc. We're allowed to do that because Kotlin is a beautiful and idiomatic language. This one's actually pretty simple. You know, for the life of me, I don't understand why it keeps putting on air on top. I'll explain this function in a moment. So puzzle is complete is actually a function which exists in the computation logic package, which we'll be writing later on, of course. And all it does is exactly what it says, but it will return either a true or a false based on whether the puzzle is complete or not. Hence is complete. Okay, so what I've done here is I've copied and pasted in the plain language use case, which describes this particular function. Now, as you can see, it's pretty complicated. To give a basic explanation of what's going on and why I did this, when we request the current game, i.e. when the application starts up, there's a number of different things that could happen. So for starters, the user could have a currently active game and they just want to retrieve it. Uh, it could be the first run of the application, so no game currently exists in storage. And then there are different situations where errors could occur along the way. This is something that happens when you're coordinating multiple different data sources. Now, I have my own system of tracking these different event streams. I use basically letters and numbers to denote steps and different potential event streams. But whatever you do, my suggestion to you is to write this down in plain language first and then go ahead writing the code. That's what I did. This comment above you see here, I wrote that before I wrote the code. Anyways, let's get started. Okay, so for our first event stream, we attempt to retrieve the current game and that returns successfully. And then we also want to know whether the current game is complete or not. We can just get rid of on complete. And here we go again. <laughs> 
So this is obviously the case where the user has first uh, loaded the application and we want to create a brand new game. And looks like I'll have to do this manually this time. Yeah, the autocomplete is not helping me here, but in fairness, uh, we haven't written that function yet. Okay, I'm just going to double check that I wrote that correctly. Now, before I want to move on, I want to explain one thing about my perspective on software architecture. While sometimes in a simpler application, we can do something like have the presenter coordinate different repositories or backend data sources, in this particular case, there was enough complicated backend logic that I wanted to have also a decision maker class, which happened to be this game repository impl on the backend. And part of the purpose of this class is to take care of the logic of coordinating these different backend data sources so that I can keep the presentation logic class doing what it's supposed to do, managing presentation logic. And then I have this class dealing with this messy kind of almost business logic type stuff here. Anyways, we're not done yet. Okay, so it just occurred to me that I have missed a function in the interface of iGame repository. So let's just go ahead and add that in. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy update game paste it down below and what we're going to call this is create new game and it's going to take in a settings object and that's it So that's actually a helper function that I created, mostly for legibility. Let's just go ahead and add that in right now. Just another quick note here, you'll notice that I like incredibly long and descriptive names of everything that's going on. This is largely because I don't have a great memory for fine details. So by making these things super long and descriptive, I don't actually have to remember them. I can just read my code and pretty much understand what it does, even in these complicated situations where we have all these different event streams and interactions occurring. Okay, only two more short functions to go.
that's it for our back end.